So I was uh, just thinking, uh, you, Noreen, and uh, the Sufan Center, as well as uh, the government of Qatar for hosting this wonderful event. Uh, we are really um, great. We, we are grateful, and we are very feel very privileged that we are able to come here and have a GRN uh, event like uh, we do every year. For those of you who are less familiar with CITED, CITED is a counterterrorism body that supports the work of the UN Security Council in various ways. I don't want to get too much into the details of that work, but when doing so, one of our secret, not so secret weapons is the Global Research Network, which is a network of around 120 research institutes from all over the world, from all continents. All of them committed themselves to supporting the work of the UN Security Council and CITED by basically providing their research and their expertise um, to global policy making. And we are firm believers that in order for global policy making to be um, um, effective, it has to be based on evidence and nothing is more uh, important when we speak about evidence than objective research by top researchers like the ones we have here in this panel and the other um, 120 research institutes. Uh, with that, let me introduce the panel members. I'll um, start from the father, uh, uh, father and then move on and then we could start the panel uh, itself. So, to your um, right is uh, Mr. Priyank Mathur, who is the founder and CEO of Mythos Labs, a global company that uses AI and media to combat violent extremism. He has a broad experience in this uh, area, and we will hear a lot about his efforts um, to develop uh, um, new counter um, narrative techniques. Some of them use comedy. And he is a person that can speak about that. He worked for the U.S. Department of Home and Security. He served as the Global Consulting Director at Ogilvy and & Mother, and what we learned also as a comedy writer at The Onion. Next to him is Ms. Uh, Rachel Fielden, who is an international campaign manager at Moonshot, where she works on the design and delivery of global counter-messaging and intervention projects. Rachel works to build impactful and sustainable mechanisms to prevent intolerance, uh, violence, extremism, using, using a tool called, a, a tool, the tool of uh, gaming, one of which called Gafi, who won her the Bronze Wabi Award and second place in the US Paris Tech Challenge. Next to Rachel is Laura, uh, Dr. Laura Kuchens, Kuchens I hope I, Kuchensen who is a fellow with the Future Conflict uh, Program at International Crisis Group. Her work focuses on the role of the online environment in shaping and segmenting and augmenting conflict dy dynamics. She was a research fellow at the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project at Princeton University and a strategic advisor to Google Jigsaw. Um, she has completed her PhD in international relations at the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and if I get it right, you're now with Stanford University at CSAC, a wonderful research center. And next to me is Mr. Malik Samuel, is investigative journalist and a research at the Institute for Security Studies. For the past nine years, his work has been focused, focused on the Boko Haram crisis, and his work focuses on the causes, on drivers of violent extremism, managing exits, from violent extremism, terrorism financing. He also learned the work, the way um, Boko Haram uses technology, in particular um, drones. All of them, as I mentioned, are wonderful partners of CITED and members of the Global Research Network, and we are very, very proud and honored to have all of you here. And I want to start the conversation with you, Malik. Malik, you studied uh, Boko Haram. For many years, um, you work with the ISS, who covers all of Africa. There was a lot of talk of here in this um, in this conference, and rightly so, about the growing threat in Africa. 
And I want to ask you, what do you see? And bear in mind, the focus of this uh, discussion as the next panel is on the links between terrorism and technology. So please, Malik. Um, thank you so much, and uh, it's a pleasure and a honor to be, to be here. Uh, so talking about um, the Boko Haram crisis, it's, uh, it's in, the, in its 14th year now, and uh, which is responsible for the death of over 40, at least 40,000 um, people, um, to, uh, mostly um, civilians. Now, the conflict in the Lake Chad Basin region covers primarily four countries, Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon, and has forced um, millions of people to flee their homes. So you imagine for the past, um, uh, for more than 10 years, people not being able to go back to their homes and not being able to access farmlands because uh, their uh, sources of livelihoods have been, have been destroyed. But uh, more, uh, more importantly, beyond this, um, these four uh, countries, uh, you also have now one of the major challenge with regards to Boko Haram is the Islamic, um, Islamic State West Africa province, which is affiliated to ISIS. Now that is the biggest um, concern because the other faction, the Jamaat al Sunnah leader Watuwa Jihad, which Shekau, the, the late Shekau used to be the, the, the leader, that group is in disarray. But ISWAP is more strategic and looks at, um, the, looks at the future. So right now what ISWAP does, people look at it who say uh, in the last few years there's been, um, I would say, a reduction in, the, in numbers of attacks and, um, and casualties. So people may say that's a good thing. Yes, it's a good thing, but then there's a reason behind that. And the reason is simply because ISWAP does not uh, deliberately target civilians. The focus of attacks for ISWAP is um, security forces, um, government officials, and humanitarian um, workers. So as much as possible, it leaves civilians out, uh, out, out of the equation. So what it focuses on is the winning, and, the winning of hearts and minds of civilians. Now, I mentioned the um, the impact of the crisis on civilians. So what ISWAP does is that, knowing that a lot of livelihood, livelihoods of, for these people have been destroyed, what it does is it involves, it engages in humanitarian um, activities. Some people find it hard to believe, but it's part of the strategy to win the hearts and minds of um, the civilians. Knowing that this region is not safe, so it provides security for people, it provides, um, a, it um, secures trade routes, and enables people to come, people who live in areas it controls, to be able to engage in trade. But this is, um, it's not just a win for the people, it's also a win for ISWAP, it's a win-win for, 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 for both parties. Because while the people engage in livelihood activities there, ISWAP uses that opportunity to raise revenue, to raise resources. So ISWAP relies on the activities of these people because they have to pay tax, um, uh, fishing permits, Cattle, um, cattle tax. Uh, people, traders also have to pay. You know, have to pay tax. So ISWAP relies on these people to raise money. When I, when uh, we did a research last year by the uh, Institute for Security Studies, showing that ISWAP raises tens of millions of dollars annually, people find it um, strange to to believe. But for people who understand the region, that before the conflict, it thrived economically. The Lake Chad Basin region especially the northeast of Nigeria, is the biggest entry point for cattle into the country. That region is also the biggest source of freshwater fish. And if you, if you look, before the conflict, red pepper, the ball pepper, contributed about $35 million to the economy of, of Niger. So it's a huge um, region economically. So with this conflict, with insecurity, what ISOP has done is to take advantage of that you know, to, uh, to take control of these activities and to be able to raise revenue. It raises this revenue in order to carry, to carry out its activities. So you see that without these resources that ISWAP is able to raise now, there will be a problem for the group because it needs the resources for a lot of things, to pay fighters. Not everybody joins uh, Boko Haram or, sorry, or ISWAP for, uh, for ideological reasons, no. The engagement dynamics that research has shown is that 
yes, people join for, ideolo for, for ideology, but a lot more people join for economic reasons, while other people also join for, um, for protection because of the excesses of security, of security forces. So there's a pool that, uh, there's a pool of people that uh, are readily available for ISWAP uh, recruitment. So to do that, it needs to become friendly with, uh, with civilians. So that is one of the reasons why you're seeing less attacks on civilians, less casualties, but it is about the future. So I think um, maybe I'll just stop here and uh, maybe you, um, so, I, so I don't take too much time. I, I want to ask you one question. When you look at the two organizations, how do they use technology? Do they, do they embrace it? Do they reject it? Um, do they use old methods, new combination of both? What do you see in in terms of Islamic State and Boko Haram? It's a, it's a combination of a both old and new method, and they use it for several reasons. They also, for uh, example, uh, ISWA particularly understands the risk associated with the use of technology, the fact that it can, it can be traced, you know, and all that. So they use technology only because it is necessary when they, they cannot do without it, so they use it. But in cases where they don't have to use it, they, as much as possible, stay away, uh, stay away from, um, from um, stay away from it. So what ISWAP uses technology basically um, for is for communication, because it needs to um, to show for propaganda reason to show its activities, but also to also counter the narrative of um, security forces, because uh, like it or not, the security forces to some extent also engage, also engage in, in, in propaganda. So a lot of times when they, when they put out information that is not, um, uh, that is not accurate, uh, kind of, you, the next day or so you see ISWAP releasing its own information, but also backed a lot of times with, uh, with, uh, with video. So people wonder how this, is, how this is possible, that something happens and uh, within a few hours, you see, you, you already have a, you already have a video of it, um, um, or, or a video of it out. So the thing is, ISOP has a very large and a very uh, a very structured media center. That media center is um, headed by the son of the late uh, of the late founder. That tells you how um, important um, the media center is. So what the media center does is that it handles all the communication. So when they go for attack. They usually have um, fighters who don't carry arms, but their duty is to take, uh, is to bring, uh, is to source for materials from the battlefield. So they go with um, cameramen. So these cameramen, they take pictures, they take videos, and found out recently that they have vehicles that are mounted with Wi-Fi. So that enables them to immediately download this, uh, uh, download this uh, materials, the videos, the pictures and all, and then send to, uh, send, uh, to, the, send to, their, uh, to their producers. And also, and you wonder, for people who are familiar with that region, it's very, very remote. So you wonder how they get access to, to, to internet facility. We just found out recently that they rely on um, Turaya, on Turaya, um, um, Turaya um, internet, internet, um, internet access, which is surprising because you don't find it that much in that region. So it, for them to have access to it, it means they have collaborators. And research has shown that they have, there are civilian collaborators who facilitate access to these um, things for, for ISWAP, not necessarily for ideological reasons, but for economic, uh, you know, for, for economic benefit. So we, we, we will get back to some of the points you mentioned, uh, because they are, they are very, very critical to our um, conversation here, including the use of drones. But I want to move, with your permission, to Laura, Laura, we, we uh, Malik mentioned or uh, summarized the use of technology by Boko Haram is they use it when they find it necessary and when they have no other ways to communicate. You studied two other in, uh, terrorist organizations back in the days. You studied ISIL and more recently uh, the Taliban. And if I got it right from reading your research, from your articles, these two organizations embraced completely technology as part of the strategy. They were much less careful. They actually developed a whole marketing strategy, um, which is pretty amazing. You mentioned 120,000 accounts associated with the Taliban. You need a whole army to probably to manage these accounts. 
So how do you see in the relations that these two or other organizations developed vis-a-vis um, -vis technology? Yeah, thank you so much. That's a great question. I mean, I think I would start off with saying that um, within the space of thinking about social media and non-CRM groups, I think what comes to mind usually is the Islamic State model, which is really flashy uh, propaganda. A lot of it is in English. It's aimed at sort of pushing a particular narrative largely to the international community and sort of the broader diaspora and engaging in foreign recruitment. And the reality is there's a breadth of actors, non-state armed groups across the globe that sort of engage in social media in a variety of ways, um, and in different ways, partly because they have different sort of strategic goals and how they're trying to deploy the technology, and also um, sort of they're, they're trying to target different audiences. So the way I like to think about it is sort of this idea of multiple information fronts that might relate to a particular conflict. So the first is, as I mentioned, sort of the international community. So as an armed group, you're, again, you're trying to reach out to sort of members of the diaspora. You're trying to do, engage in foreign recruitment. You're also trying to shift international perception of the conflict or sort of confuse um, understanding of what's happening on the ground to potentially sort of promote an advantageous narrative or, or garner international support. Um, so, you know, the Taliban, I think, pushed out particular narratives um, during, basically, to what you alluded to, I, 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 with, along with colleagues, conducted sort of research on um, the tweets of the Taliban during the um, summer 2021 takeover period of Afghanistan and what they were pushing out. Um, and so towards the international community, it was actually a small percentage of the tweets. It was only 10% of tweets were in English. The remainder was in Pashto, Dari, and Urdu. Um, and the, that sort of 10%, a little bit of it about, was about sort of disparaging U.S. forces, um, uh, accusing them of war crimes. Among the top most mentioned accounts was Human Rights Watch. They would tag Human Rights Watch in tweets and say, you should pay attention to sort of U.S. forces or Afghan national security forces to sort of, again, promote, promote disparaging um, narratives uh, aimed at the international community. The second layer is more about sort of domestic audiences. So I also did some research on um, sort of the, the varied armed groups in Syria and Libya. Um, and they have more, far more like localized aims, and that's reflected in how they use social media. So for example, you know, among the several hundred armed groups, a lot of them had Facebook pages. And we saw during COVID, for example, one group, I, I believe it was a Libyan armed group, had 18 different Facebook pages, each devoted to sort of a specific governance um, uh, function that the group performed in the area under their control, including one about uh, COVID cases. So they were going around, they were documenting COVID cases in the area under their control, and they were uh, like uploading information about COVID, uh, about PPE, and where they were documenting cases to the Facebook page to communicate that with the community. They also had a Facebook page dedicated to sort of their um, judiciary and sort of the laws they were implementing in the area of the control. And then the third is about sort of the actual kinetic sort of conflict space. Um, and with the Taliban, a lot of how they were using it, um, so you're, you'll see interactions between different armed groups or the state and the armed group, um, sort of fighting it out over social media. Um, in the case of the Taliban, for example, they were pushing out a bunch of narratives around encouraging defection, saying, you know, we, the Taliban, will welcome defecting soldiers, the Afghan National Security Forces, with, wel with welcome arms. And in fact, here, it was a piece of disinformation, but it was images of supposed sort of defectors that had, you know, seen the light and were joining the Taliban. Um, there were also, you know, sort of to Malik's point about, um, they were sort of live streaming, the Taliban were, during the takeover as they were moving from city to city um, on the Twitter accounts. Um, and part of that was sort of this, um, it seems like there was a psychological strategy there to basically, they, they would say, we're about to take the city in the next day or two. Um, then during the takeover of the city, they were sort of uh, highlighting battle deaths that they caused. And then in the aftermath, they would, say, they would um, send out Taliban reporters into the community um, and basically highlight the utopia of a city now sort of occupied by them as a force. So depending on sort of the, again, the strategy of whether or not they want to push out narratives that are advantageous to sort of things in the kinetic battle space or shifting narratives around the, the domestic um, or local community or international community, they'll pursue divergent strategies um, in using social media. Well, what you describe, Laura, is an organization that, at least in public perception, seemed to be very outdated, mm. conservative, rejection of all any, everything about modernity. And at the same time, this organization, and you shared with us that in 
was able to develop the website Taliban.com in 1999 when most 1998, people, yes, 1998, yeah. when most people, including myself, they didn't, probably didn't even think that there is such possibility. They begin a marketing campaign that ends up with taking over of Kabul already in 2019 and with very clear messages to the international community to, uh, how do they do it? I mean, there is somebody there, probably more than one person, that really understands media, understands marketing, understands audience, and how to target 120,000 accounts. How all this operation works? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to depend on the armed group. In the Taliban's case, I think it was pretty clear from their sort of inception, even as sort of a government, a governing regime um, in the 1990s, they really understood the importance of information control. Um, and so even though, you know, to your point, domestically in Afghanistan at the time, the average Afghan didn't have access to phone lines, let alone the internet. So why in the world were they creating, you know, a website and, and you know, getting the domain www.taliban.com. A lot of it had to do with trying to shift international perception of the group. And that's why at the same time, even though they didn't want pictures of specific members, they would invite foreign journalists in and to be able to share messaging. Then I think what happened basically is in the aftermath of sort of fleeing to Pakistan, they, they were able to kind of connect with Al-Qaeda. Um, and there's reports that basically they had access to Al-Qaeda's media sort of um, center, and they were able to rely on a lot of those resources. But a lot of their sort of uh, strategy with information communication technology and propaganda up and, you know, sort of reflected this iterative process of understanding the role of information. And from 2003 to 2006 in Afghanistan, there was a lot of money pouring in to sort of build ICT infrastructure and country. And so they had to figure out ways to sort of navigate a new information environment in a bunch of different ways. And so it was iterative. They like re they created a new website back in 2005. It was like the original iteration of alamara.com that persisted in various language iterations through the takeover period um, until it was sort of, there was a lot of international backlash basically because I think the, the, the server that was hosting that website didn't realize until after the takeover. It was an American owned company. Didn't realize until after the takeover that they were hosting several Taliban websites. Um, and I think there's a, I think from 2005 onwards too, it was sort of um, district level commanders and above all had laptops. Um, they launched, um, it was promptly taken down, but they did launch like a Pashtu language app in the, you know, in the app store. And they were really trying, like, again, they, they've been on Twitter since 2011, 2012, publicly getting into fights with like NATO officials and, you know, um, and, I think a lot of times um, they were able to sort of grow without much interference and in, in a slightly different way than Islamic State did because I think a lot of the American companies weren't necessarily monitoring it. Among the sort of core network of Taliban leadership accounts that we looked at in the study, there was, there was a significant percentage that had had, those Taliban accounts had been active for like the last four to five years without any bans or interventions taking place. So, so, so what we, we've seen, at least in the, in the first half of, uh, of this uh, panel, is four organizations that are ahead of the game in two ways. First, in the way they embrace technology to promulgate the message, and they are ahead of governments in the, in, in the sense of how far governments do not understand how much they are embracing um, technology and only looking past a few years later to say, oh, they actually had this and had that. And this is a point where NGOs, private sector, can and actually did step in to offer few counter-narrative uh, counter approaches both of them are, uh, at least the, the two that we will see here, are very innovative. And they actually, both of you, and we'll go now to, to you, uh, Rachel, um, first, were able to fill in the gap that policymakers were missing by looking on this messaging and trying to counter it. And I really want to hear on the tools that you developed and Jigsaw, and perhaps if you could say a few words about Jigsaw for those who are less familiar with you. Yeah, sure. So, um, Moonshot works in collaboration with Jigsaw to create, I guess, several different intervention method methods online. Uh, we're essentially a data insights company that uses these insights to you provide ethical and data-driven uh, interventions to vulnerable individuals, particularly in the online space. 
Um, Myths and disinformation, I'm just gonna say disinformation to begin with, and the whole communication sphere is, it's ever evolving and it's adaptive and the solutions necessary for countering it need to be sustained and equally as adaptable. Um, the biggest challenge in this space particularly is the effect called like the rabbit hole effect, if you will, where if you believe one piece of disinformation, you're more likely to believe another. Um, and as researchers, as practitioners in this space, I think it's incredibly easy to fall into a sort of fact-checking, debunking, whack-a-mole cycle, um, which is incredibly important and necessary. But what we need to do, particularly to respond to such nimble and advanced strategies, communication strategies, is to build what I kind of call, and is maybe a bit of <laughs> pompous phrasing, but kind of a symbiotic counter disinformation ecosystem that is built up of um, debunking, fact checking, and media literacy. Um, the problem with that is that it's really boring, to be honest, like that's not interesting. It's not as interesting as um, figuring out something super salacious about the government or <laughs> feeling like you've uncovered a grand conspiracy, like that does something to you, that releases a huge amount of endorphins, which I'm sorry, but media literacy and debunking just doesn't. Um, so what we try and do at Moonshot is <laughs> try and bring those same feelings to something that's really quite boring uh, in our interventions. Um, so one of the ways in which we've done that is we've built out a, alongside a, other strategies as well. We built a game in Indonesia where I, my work is focused. Um, this game employs psychological theories such as the inoculation theory developed by Maguire and tested at the University of Cambridge, which is based on the idea that if you are given um, resilience or are exposed to several types of disinformation or strategies of disinformation, you are more likely then to be able to respond to any other kind of disinformation. I think it's kind of considered a bit of a vaccine. Um, it's very similar to a vaccine in that you're given a dose of disinformation and hopefully you'll be able to counter more wherever you go. So we try and employ that strategy in the game where our users are empowered to, well, they're, they're in the situation where they're in a very familiar WhatsApp family chat, um, which I think we're all well aware and can experience some of our family members sending us disinformation that we maybe quite not know how to handle or go combat. Um, and the user is empowered and emboldened to experience this, to live with this, to see very common strategies that are being employed by extremist groups and even by, I guess, benign actors in Indonesia, um, and learn how to respond to it. Um, and the better they do, I suppose, the better <laughs> effects they get. And that's um, also the kind of the psychological theory of gamification. It turns passive consumption of media literacy or, um, I guess, other quite trite, boring education methods into something that the person is actively engaging with and actively thinking about and caring about um, with strategies and situations that they've come across in their real world. Mm -hmm. um, this is just, I guess, one example of multiple strategies that we're employing at Moonshot uh, and from other practitioners as well. I think Priyan can speak a bit more about Mythos Labs um, to counter disinformation and build psychological resilience. But we move, before we move to Priyan, I have one question for you. Um, Moonshot is, is not governments. No. no. And the question I have, you, I have for you is what governments should do? I remember one, one, one person once told me that when government produced content, the relation, the ratio was one to, two, one, to one thousand, meaning it costs one thousand times more than the clips produced by ISIL, yeah. and it reached one thousand less people yeah. for every one person that watched the State Department clip, one thousand people watched the Islamic State clip. Yeah. So it cost one thousand times more and reached and was 1,000 times less effective. Yeah. Moonshot is doing amazing work and has tools that governments don't have. Yeah. What governments should do? Should they just stand back and let Moonshot and others to do their work? Should they support you? Should they? What would be your advice? Yeah, I mean, of course, they're welcome to support us. Of course. <laughs> but I think more broadly, like. But I wouldn't it, it goes... hurt your credibility if they yeah. do? Yeah, I think it's. Um, it goes back to that point, right, about um, 
salacious information and probably quick formatted information is a lot more exciting than probably like governments are putting out as well. Um, I think Laura kind of spoke to this as well with the way that the Taliban were becoming kind of enforcers and reliable information um, uh, arbiters. Uh, the same thing is happening in Indonesia but in, in this COVID pandemic. Uh, whilst I guess, politicians in Indonesia and the government were spreading quite a lot of smears against one another, focusing on what the other was not doing, um, the violent extremist group kind of took to Twitter to become the arbiters of health information. And um, that probably took a lot less effort for them, cost a lot less, and I think had a greater impact and built a lot more trust amongst people who were not interested. So what I think governments need to do is, I guess, I, I'm not a government official, I don't have experience in that area, so I'm happy for the next panelists to come and refute me or offer different ideas, but it's about strategic communications and being nimble, being as nimble as possible, working with organizations that can hopefully be more affordable, can offer nimble insights. And the thing is with governments, there might, there might not be a huge amount of risk appetite as well. I think that's often what gets in the way, that's often what makes it expensive, and that's often what makes it uninteresting. Um, so maybe it's worth considering that. I don't know how you do Fine. that, but yeah. Um, I, I, will, I will probably ask Priyank the same yeah, question, but them. not before we want to hear. So Rachel spoke about how Muncho developed gaming as a tool uh, to counter that narrative and propaganda. You used comedy, and in wonderful ways, I had the pleasure of listening to you in Delhi, a uh, few months ago, but the audience haven't. So please share with us uh, your own experience with uh, sure. counter narratives. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to TSC as well for having us here. Um, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to counter narratives or alternative narratives, it, we, we always talked about it at, back in 2016, 2017, when this was, uh, when ISIS, or tw even earlier than that, when ISIS was sort of at its peak in terms of territory, there was a lot of talk about countering terrorist use of the internet and technology. We were using those words, but we were really talking about communication strategies. And that's because it's easier to get funding for something that has technology in it than communications. Um, so we just need to be honest about what we're actually doing here with these techniques. Some of them are very heavily technology related, of course. Some of them are actually just comms, strategic comms, as you mentioned. So what we did is, you know, I, I used to work at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security back in, you know, pre-Bin Laden assassination times when, when it was a totally different landscape. And um, I remember, you know, I, I'm went to strategic, uh, I, I went into the private sector and I was working at Ogilvy and I was on a train back to DC um, and I read an article in 2015 in Vice about how ISIS had just taken the movie that had come out American Sniper with Bradley Cooper and they had replaced his face and put in an ISIS guy's face and re-released it on Twitter as ISIS Sniper and it got hundreds of thousands of views before Twitter took it down. And I remember meeting an old friend from uh, State Department and uh, he worked in CTCV, and I said, you know, what are we doing, the U.S. government, to counter this? ISIS is creating all this kind of... And I saw, you know, there was an official YouTube channel or something, and it had a person in army fatigue saying, hey, son, don't become a terrorist. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, if you're a kid in, in Turkey or in India or in northern Africa, and you've got two choices between the cool ISIS propaganda video or this, of course you're going to choose that. So the idea to use comedy was influenced by my own background. I used to work at The Onion as a comedy writer, and our head writer used to say, you know, anything can be funny if there's absurdity at the heart of it. And violent extremist ideology is absurd. And actually, the kinds of comedians we liked to work with were the comedians who weren't just doing it for the money. They weren't just doing it for the social impact either, because then they, if they were too much on that scale, they probably weren't funny. They were doing it because they genuinely saw potential for humor. So it was about taking something that had worked in the private sector. And by the way, at Ogilvy and other advertising companies, they were doing the same thing years before, working with influencers, working with comedians to market their products. So the idea was recombinant innovation. Can we take something that's already working in another industry and apply it to PCVE? And the results were, were quite promising and showed, we actually did a project with Moonshot in Malaysia comparing comedic CVE videos versus non-comedic, and the results were overwhelmingly that even high-risk audiences were paying more attention, watching for longer, responding better to comedic videos. And They're great videos. I recommend watching them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I also wanted to just uh, zoom out a bit and talk about 
you know, these are, our, our first two panelists did an excellent job of recapping how terrorist groups are using technology today, especially with digital media. But if we think about tomorrow, um, one of the mistakes that's very frustrating, I would imagine, to many of us in this room who have been working in this space for years and decades is I think we can now admit that we were reactive. We, the security community, was reactive to social media and underestimated its transformative potential. Uh, 20 years ago when Facebook and YouTube came out. I had a supervisor at Homeland Security who used to say Facebook, oh, Facebook is for computer geeks and kids. And um, two decades later, you know, that computer geeks and kids company is, is, is pretty darn influential. So um, I just wanna, I think we're at a tipping point where we're, we, we have the chance to not repeat that mistake with two new and very powerful emerging technologies, which is generative AI and the metaverse. And I mean, everybody by now has heard of ChatGPT. But what's incredible is, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of well-meaning and well-reasoned arguments saying, well, this might be overhyped. Some people snicker when you say the metaverse. They say Facebook changed its name and what happened? We haven't been, I'm not on the metaverse. But the rate at which these technologies are being adopted is unprecedented in the history of mankind. I mean, ChatGPT came out four months ago and it's estimated that 100 million people have already used it. That's one out of 80 people on the planet. You know, we, we may laugh at the metaverse, but the fact is that 15% of the digital economy has already shifted to the metaverse. The biggest brands in the world, from Coca-Cola to Nike to Disney, are investing tens of millions of dollars in this. So unless we know something they don't, um, I wouldn't bet against it. And I think that's important for terrorism and thinking about that because it sounds far-fetched right now to say, oh, but, but terrorists using the metaverse, terrorists using generative AI. But like you, know, you mentioned in 1998, the Taliban was already like, very, very savvy about the potential of the internet. And I think we shouldn't underestimate that that could happen again. We should actually this time get ahead of the problem, take proactive measures to start thinking about potential risks now. I get asked a lot, well, are terrorists using these technologies? Do we have evidence? First of all, we do. Last year, Russia arrested, a, I think it was a 16-year-old boy in Siberia for blowing up a virtual replica of the FSB security headquarters in the metaverse in a very popular game called Minecraft. And he was sentenced to five years in prison for training for terrorist activities. Um, if you follow you know, dark web chatter among illicit transnational groups and even some state actors, if we're being honest, there's a lot of talk already about how we can exploit generative AI to flood the information space and create large volumes of disinfo and propaganda. You mentioned 120,000 Taliban accounts. They're probably being run right now by troll farms. I visited a troll farm in Kosovo a couple years ago. It's an incredibly inefficient process. There's people taking coffee breaks. There's you know, folks talking about leaving early so they can attend a party. Imagine if instead of a troll farm, you're using a, uh, you know, a bootleg version of ChatGPT, which doesn't have safety guardrails in place, which is easy to make. I, I actually think one of the mistakes that we make here is we keep talking about ChatGPT. ChatGPT is just the application built on the underlying model. The underlying model is what is scary to me. GPT-4 just dropped yesterday. I don't know how many people might have, might have heard about that yesterday. GPT-4 is the iteration of GPT-3.5, which is what ChatGPT was built on. Just to give you an idea of how much more advanced this thing is, and remember, it's dropped four months after ChatGPT. ChatGPT got a 10%, uh, it scored in the 10th percentile when it took the bar exam. GPT-4 scored above 90th percentile. So that's four months of progress. At that rate, GPT-7 is gonna be present in the United States. So I think that we need to get ahead of this by, you asked what can governments do, they can upskill their workforce, right? National security professionals, how many intelligence analysts know what the currency used in the Decentraland metaverses? How many MISO, you know, military information support operations specialists know how to use an AI text um, detector to figure out if text was created likely using generative AI? My guess is very few. That's a huge security vulnerability. We need to start training people, and I don't just mean a lunch and learn or a casual conference. We need to have systemic upskilling programs in place for information operations specialists so that they can learn how to understand, recognize, and potentially even mitigate some of these threats that are on the horizon. And if we keep waiting to say, well, let's just see if they actually use it, we're gonna be, in the, we're gonna be right back here in the year 2045 at the you know, 50th edition of this conference saying, well, what could we have done? 
differently back when generative AI came out. Just like now we're having congressional hearings about, well, maybe Facebook's algorithm was flawed from the beginning. Maybe, well, that's a conversation we should have had 20 years ago. Facebook wasn't building this in secret. So, sorry, that was very long, but I'm passionate about this, as you could see, yeah. <laughs> uh, and you were fascinating as always, Thank and you. you also answered my question before I even asked, so that's amazing. But I have a few questions, but before I do, I wonder whether any of you would like to react to any of the other presenters. Um, Malik? Yes. Um, yeah, so for, uh, for the Lake Chad uh, Basin uh, um, region, the context is uh, 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 much different from what has been said, especially with regards to the Taliban and the access to the media that, um, that they have. So um, ISWAP right now relies a lot on ISIS for the media production. So what ISWAP does is it sends people to the field, they get these um, this materials, then they communicate, to, they communicate to ISIS and then ISIS produces you know, and disseminate. So, for ISWAP, it uses basically two channels. One is um, WhatsApp, and uh, uh, the other one is um, Telegram. Telegram is the preferred one, where they have channels and they, they, but on social media, like the Twitter, Facebook, and all that, they are not um, present. So it's basically Telegram that they, that they rely on. So um, what Priyank said is, is uh, it will work. If at the global level, it's, um, um, it's countered and ISIS does not have the ability to support ISWAP. That is, um, that is good because at the end, it will be about collaborations between those who don't have the access to this um, technology and then with those who already have the, the, the expertise and the access to the technology. It's about bringing them together. If they're able to come together, you know, they, can, uh, they can wreak havoc. So I think for me it's about disrupting that, um, that, uh, that coming together between these different uh, violent extremist groups. Yeah. That's a good, a very good point. And Laura, Rachel, would you like to react to any of the other comments made by? Sure, yeah, I think one point that I, I think um, sort of speaks to both Rachel and Priyank's point about um, the fact that sort of like the online ecosystem is like ever evolving and there's new ways. And I think it's oftentimes when we, and there's conversation about how you deal with sort of different terrorist groups or non terrorist groups engaging online. There's this idea of, well, if we only just develop the right policies on the platform side, then, you know, we could remove them. But the, the reality is a lot of these groups, they're smart. They're monitoring, you know, how, what policies these platforms are putting out and, and sort of reorienting around it and, you know, surveying what new technology is out there and trying to think about ways to integrate it. I know there was, for example, um, I think it was like in a New York Times piece a few years ago documenting how um, Hamas and Hezbollah um, sort of saw that a lot of their Facebook pages were, were, were getting taken down um, and they read over basically the policy around depictions of overt violence on the platform. And so they then basically turned to using proxy accounts that were like community. So it was like either local mosques or, you know, organizations. And they basically had those organizations post content on behalf of the group. And then they also provided them with like a set of rules, um, sort of instructing them on the type of content they should or shouldn't be posting based on sort of what Facebook was doing in response to their content. Um, so I think it's really important to understand that sort of these, these groups are ever sort of adapting and, and thinking about new ways to sort of, even I think with, you know, this relates to the panel uh, on sort of the alt-right, um, you know, that, that happened yesterday. Um, it's been documented that sort of, at, you know, because a lot of the platforms took concerted efforts to try and remove alt-right related content, at least, you know, in the states from their platforms, that they tried to develop new lexicons to basically signal to other insiders who they were and, and sort of the group. And again, I think that, that broader sort of adaptation or evolution of these groups online is something to kind of think about. And that's why I think it needs sort of this like multi-pronged innovative approach that's iterative. Rachel, Rachel please. Yeah, I think I could speak to what you just mentioned, Laura, about um, that adaptive use of online platforms. Um, We've seen, at least in my work in the UK, um, extreme far-right groups using, like, completely manipulating the way that the platforms are used, but um, by hosting live streaming events and competitions um, on games such as, like, Call of Duty Warfare. And, um, you know, that's an incredibly fun game. A lot of people play it, and it's very easy to see how somebody with, you know, who just wants some companionship online gets involved with gaming communities, playing a game that they enjoy, and they happen to stumble in this 
on this live stream where they're promising them lots of money and then they have to fall into their other platforms and their other Telegram and BitChute and more encrypted places. Um, it's very easy to see how um, that radicalization process can take place, especially in the, the gaming sphere, which I can speak to. Yeah. I, th I think what, what, what you all alluded to is, allude to is that terrorists in general are not that creative in developing new, yeah. innovating. Yeah. They're not. It's mm -hmm. not what we're seeing in the movies. Yeah. But they're very, very good in taking or utilizing technologies that were meant for one purpose yeah. and repurpose them for their use. And these technologies could be a Facebook platform or a drone that's supposed to uh, take a delivery from one place to another or chat GPT or any other a tool that we develop, uh, not we, I'm not, I've been probably the last person to develop such things, but companies and uh, private, uh, private companies develop uh, for the benefit of all of us and they immediately are able to find their weaknesses and repurpose uh, them. And that goes to a broader question that I hope will be part of the next panel, which is how can we encourage technology companies to develop tools with safety by design? so is to minimize the risk of them being misused for any purpose, including terrorism, but not uh, just that. I know our time is closed to up, and I want to run all four of you with one question. We have many people who are involved in policy making in this audience, and also many more who are watching us uh, through the live stream. And if I were to ask you to give one recommendation to policymakers at the national or international level, how to deal with this extremely complex challenge, what would be? And I want to start with you, Pridak, and then go all uh, the way back to you, Malik. One recommendation. If you want to think more, we could come back to no, you. No, no, I, 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 um, I think one recommendation would be that uh, policymakers should well, it's, it's three related things, but it's, it's what we talked about, upscaling their own workforce, inoculating. We talked about inoculation theory, you know, to put it in pandemic terms, with which we're all sadly familiar, if Miss Disinfo is the, vac is the virus, media literacy is the vaccine. So finding innovative ways to do inoculation. And third, creating incentives for technology companies to ensure safe design. And I think one of those ways is making incentives for them to have cross-disciplinary teams designing these systems. It shouldn't be a silo of software engineers at Meta or Microsoft or Google working on these systems. It should involve social scientists, ethicists, folks with national security expertise, so that if we embed those folks in the design to begin with, we won't be having some of the issues that we're having with social media years down the line. Rachel, one recommendation. And you could say, I agree yeah. with everything. I mean, I, I, yeah, I couldn't say it much better. <laughs> but I suppose I would add to it in um, one recommendation that I would give would be what I touched on earlier about being nimble. Like, exactly as you said, hiring the people, bringing in communi strategic communications, bringing in ad to, to experts in tech, um, and making that a part of the government strategy for countering and strategic communications. I think that's the only way to stay as nimble, as entertaining, <laughs> as reliable, uh, and staying on top of um, technology's use by malign actors. Sounds great. Laura? Um, yeah, I would echo what, what my other panelists would say. I would say like a very specific um, example I think that came out of the Taliban work was we were seeing that um, oftentimes the Taliban would meet with, for example, the United Nations, and then they would take to Twitter, um, and they would post the specific name of the official they met with, and then falsely characterize sort of what that meeting uh, meant in terms of whether the institution or the organization endorsed what the Taliban were doing. And I think oftentimes when I have conversations with folks in government and at some of these inst like international institutions, the way that sort of the, um, uh, public communications is set up, and you know, understandably so, is that there's this bureaucratic process by which a public message that's sort of issued in, in response has to go through several people. And I think to the point about being nimble, um, I think there needs to be a different model for how we, we go about sort of having like counter interventions, at least on the government and institution side. The other thing I would say is that I think sort of conflict settings are uniquely, I think, vulnerable to the impact of, of disinformation in a lot of ways, because if you're living in a conflict setting, oftentimes 
information baseline, even if social media wasn't an issue, trying to find accurate, reliable information that you're then using to make informed decisions about where to flee to or what group uh, is in control of what area is really hard to determine where the truth is. So I think the role of institutions in trying to provide resources around accurate information um, to sort of safeguard lives is also really important. Okay. And if I may add to your comment, you also highlight in your research digital literacy. And that's a far broader uh, uh, conversation that unfortunately we won't have time. I know you also mentioned that in, the, in, the, in, in previous visits. Malik, the last word is for you. If you were to recommend one, uh, one recommendation for policy makers when they approach the use of technology by terrorist organization, what would be your recommendation? Um, for me, for our, our region where I come from, it would be first denying this access to this violent extremist group. If you deny them the access, access to this technology, access to resources especially, then it becomes difficult for them to, uh, to even talk about laying their hands on it, uh, on, on this technology, let alone even having the ability to even use. So first is to deny them this, um, this access. So that is about collaboration between not just one country, but the countries uh, where, this, where this crisis um, um, exists. Listen, I could have stayed with you uh, all for another three, four hours, but um, our time is up. I, th I think there's, we're getting signals that we have to move to the next panel. I'm so very glad that we gave them, I hope you have the audience appetite for the next panel, which will continue the conversation about uh, technology uh, and terrorism from a different perspective. I'm very curious to learn uh, more, and I hope... Uh, we all learn. So thank you all very much for coming to this conference and for participating and for your support to all of us. And please join me in thanking the panel members.